Hello, good night. Today, our guest is Professor Mark Stanford. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? Hi, very well, thanks. How are you? I'm great, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So, Mark, tell us a little about yourself. What is your area of specialization? Uh, well, I'm a cognitive anthropologist, so um, my... Uh, uh, my research combines aspects of psychology and social anthropology, and um, in particular, I work within uh, um, the, an area kind of known as cultural evolution, um, which is um, basically trying to bring together um, uh, what we know from lots of different fields like anthropology, sociology, psychology, um, and apply um, models from evolutionary theory to understand how cultural phenomena uh, spread um, throughout a population um, and, uh, and become stable and, and change over time. All right. So you're interested in studying how society scale up. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I'm I actually said, having trouble hearing you. No, I, I said, um, so So this means that you are interested in understanding how society scale. Um, how, how society scale. So, how society how scale. So oh, how society scale. Um, so, okay, maybe that'll work better. Sorry, I, I, can, I think I can hear you. Um, yeah, I can do hear wanna... quite well, but I'll repeat the question, okay. not a problem. So okay. this okay, means sorry. then that you are interested in exploring how society scale. Scale? Yes. Um, they, they yes. Develop, yes. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, in part, that's true. So it's, so one of the main questions that we, we, we were trying to um, investigate is, how humans solve cooperation problems at different scales. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, so that, that does include um, the question of how societies, how larger societies uh, can hold together and, and solve problems, yeah. But Mark, I am yet to read a book or listen to an anthropologist who is able to tell us how do countries get to Denmark? There isn't a book on that topic. How do countries get to Denmark? So Denmark is known for high quality institutions, trust and economic growth. For, for some, it's a perfect country. How do countries get to Denmark? That's a difficult question. I know I'm yet to meet someone who's able to answer it. Well, you know, there's a lot of different uh, ideas about that. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of competing theories about, about this um, uh, from economists and historians and all sorts of people like that. You know, the, 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 um, <laughs> um, the, the thing is that you, you have to understand that um, there are different sort of timescales that we're looking at. So, you know, um, uh, when we're talking about um, how societies, how big societies actually work and hold together, a lot of what we were interested in anthropology is, uh, you know, how this has happened over the course of the last sort of 11,000 years um, uh, on, on the whole, what's the sort of bigger picture of, of, of what uh, gets big societies going and keeps them, and keeps them uh, going. Um, in, a, in a very specific case, like, um, like kind of recent 20th century uh, Western European, you know, countries, for example, there's a lot of sort of specific historical details, some of which we would consider to be effectively random variation from the point of view of our models. So, you know, it's not, uh, I don't think we could sort of, if you wanted to give a story of something very specific like Denmark, uh, you could, you, you know, you'd have to weave together a lot of different elements, right? Because there's historical elements uh, involved, historical particularities of where Europe was a few hundred years ago. Uh, you know, um, the history of colonialism, the history of uh, Christianity, um, you know, all of those things. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim that, um, that uh, what I'm working on is going to give you a simple answer to that question. But uh, it is a tiny piece of a, of, of a bigger puzzle, which you could use to answer that question. All right. But Mark, please go ahead and tell us about some of your findings, if you have done research on the topic. <laughs> 
Uh, sure. So I'm, and Mark, um, the examples can be for any region or country or tribe. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so uh, just to kind of talk about my recent research, um, this paper that just came out last year. Um, uh, sort of one of the, the things that I've been looking at is this um, is this idea of how religions are structured, um, and um, um, there's a, a kind of long debate um, in the social sciences about um, about religion, and in, and in fact there's a long debate in the evolutionary um, literature about religion, and you know some people sort of say well um, religions. Uh, evolve um, but not because they help um, humans not because they help societies actually stick together but because they they just kind of almost like a virus they kind of um, they evolve to take advantage of human um, cognitive frailties or something and then they and then they spread um, without any benefit to, to people other people say that religions have an evolutionary benefit for humans that they help us you know organize uh, cooperation and, and that sort of thing um, uh, my research is kind of um, uh, somewhere in between those two, um, but uh, um, one thing that I've been kind of trying to shed light on is is that um, is that you know even people who do think religions are beneficial, um, you know, especially a lot of religious believers, what they'll often say is that something like uh, Christianity or Buddhism. Uh, the official versions of those religions are um, are kind of concerned with morality and they're concerned with um, uh, getting people to think about a higher purpose and so those are the really moral things but then there's all these so-called superstitions that come along with them um, these things that um, that people are really not supposed to do but they do anyway um, so Christians, you know, in many parts of the world, many parts of Europe until quite recently, they still practice witchcraft and they still believed in, uh, you know, all kinds of astrology and stuff like that. Same is true in Buddhism and Islam and other religions. Um, and my research has been really about showing that that's not quite right. I, I, I argue that actually these so-called superstitions are also very important for organizing cooperation at a smaller scale. So the, the bigger uh, religions help to kind of create these, these big collectivities that are trans-regional, trans-local collectivities. Um, so you get organization of cooperation between strangers in different places. Um, but, you, but these sort of local little religious traditions um, that are often derided as superstitions may be underpinning um, smaller scale cooperation, which is also important for, for social organization. So that's, all, that's a, all right, Mark. So I'm, I'm guessing that you're talking about the paper that we're going to discuss tonight. Why do great yeah. and little traditions coexist in the world's doctrinal religions? And Mark, I want yeah. to be clear. When we discuss great and little traditions, we're not really talking about syncretic religions. So as you said earlier, Christianity has maintained some of its pagan roots, although we shouldn't use the word pagan because pagan actually means a rural person. But during the medieval ages, many Europeans, they lived in rural communities and as such, they were called pagans. They weren't really Christians until later. And when they became Christians, they kept some of their pagan beliefs. So we're not really talking about syncretic religion. So there's the Roman Catholic Church and some people are baptized into that faith, but they still preserve voodoo, for example. We're not talking about syncretic religion. We're discussing how religion evolves. So Christianity is systematic, but some people may still be mystical. Is this what you mean? Well, I, I would be careful. Um, I would be careful with the idea of syncretism because um, I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying. We, I mean, we, we 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 might be talking about that. Okay, but you know, um, this isn't really a question of where uh, these things come from. So, you know, somebody. The, the example of voodoo is a is 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 a good example because you might convert to Christianity. Um, but still practice voodoo uh, practices, and um, the and in that particular case, um, the, the you know Christianity might represent what I'm talking 
about a so-called great tradition and, and voodoo might represent what what I'm talking about is a so-called little tradition. The, the, the concepts of great and little are kind of, um, they're kind of only really defined relative to each other. So, um, so you know, if, if someone um, converts to a religion, which is, um, which is ostensibly trying to stop them from doing these other things, but they still keep doing them. Um, and, and, and that becomes part of the sort of, um, local religious context, the local interpretation of the religion as a whole, then that's that, that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So it, it may or may not be syncretic. Exactly. Um, this is exactly what I'm saying. It, it is not necessarily syncretic. Yeah, it may or may not be. Yeah, yeah so I'm agreeing with you. So we have defined great okay, and okay. little tradition. I like to give definitions. I never assume that people know. But in your article, you also discuss cognitively optimal systems and elaborated systems. Explain, what, what's the difference? Uh, sorry, did you say cognitively optimal yeah, co systems? Cognitively optimal religious systems and doctrinally elaborated systems. What's the difference? So the idea is that, um, is that uh, we, um, by virtue of our sort of neurological uh, structure, we have certain cognitive um, biases. Um, so, for example, it's easier for us to think um, about supernatural forces as being um, um, kind of embodied in, in human-like form rather than to think of them as sort of abstract concepts, right? So when you have, um, uh, uh, you know, but, but there's often religious doctrines that try to sort of go against these intuitions. So, for example, you know, the, the idea of the Judeo-Christian gods, um, you know, there are many theologians who will, uh, who will tell you that God is not actually um, a person, right? God is a kind of, is a more abstract concept than that. And, um, you know, God, for example, um, uh, it, because he is um, omnipotent and he's omnipresent, right? Um, that means that he, he, um, he doesn't have to divide his attention between different places, right? But then if you ask people, ordinary, you know, lay practitioners, um, you know, do you think God noticed when you did that, that, that did something wrong, for example? Often people will say, oh no, I don't think he would have noticed that, right? Because, because we, the cognitively optimal thing is, or the sort of intuitive thing is to think of God more like, you know, like a person. Um, so the doctrine is trying to steer you away from that. It's trying to tell you, um, I know, it, you know, you, you know, even if it's natural to think of him as a person, he's not a person. But your brain is constantly kind of biased toward toward the sort of easier way of thinking about things. All all right, but but I have another question. It's a follow up question: cognitively hmm. optimal religious systems versus doctrinally elaborated systems. Because mm. for let's say, for instance, a layman is reading your article and he sees cognitively optimal religious systems, what should he think? By cognitively optimal, are you saying that we're using less intellectual and philosophical powers? Because when I read your article, in a sense, you were distinguish you're, you're making a distinct you're you're making a distinction between the intellectual import of the doctrinally elaborated system versus the cognitively optimal religious system. So is a cognitively optimal religious system optimal in the sense that because we're cognitive misers, it's easier for us to digest? Uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I, yeah, I mean, okay, that, that is one way that, that, uh, that it can be cognitively optimal. I, you know, so it can be that it's a lower effort to understand it um, uh, in, in a certain way. Um, it's not necessarily just effort that we're talking about. Um, that, that sort of phrase, um, the optimality in that phrase, what that really refers to uh, is, um, is that these are kind of beliefs and practices which are optimally adapted to um, taking advantage of the way our cognitive architecture is shaped. So, um, in other words, they, they are um, they probably are lower efforts to process, but um, but it's yeah, you know, it's kind of um, rather than fighting against our, our our sort of cognitive biases, they go along with our cognitive biases. Yes, as you write, 
Those doctrinal systems are not only highly elaborated, they are highly cultivated in that, in that their maintenance entails considerable work. They require, for example, institutional mm -hmm. arrangement for supervision and enforcement, regular repetition of beliefs and practices to sediment them in semantic and procedural memory and the, and the training and it mnemonic supports typically fo focused around rote learning and authoritative interpretation of sacred texts. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to make it clear for our listeners. Mark, mm -hmm. in your piece, you arrived at a rather striking conclusion. Universalism mm -hmm. and great traditions. We often assume that great traditions are moralistic and universalistic, but your conclusion is a bit more nuanced. Tell us a little about it. Um, so this is a very interesting question, I, and, and, and I think uh, one which, um, uh, which has a lot of potential implications. So I, I should say to begin with, this, this paper is, is only looking at one case. So we're, we're suggesting that the findings may be applicable more broadly, um, but that's just a hypothesis right now. So right now we, we, we can only really say this in the case of um, Burmese Buddhism, which is where, which is where we, um, we actually ran these studies. But um, the idea is this, that, um, you know, um, Anybody who reads Buddhist scriptures, Buddhist texts, will see that, of course, there, there are um, moral ideas there um, which suggest that you should cultivate love for all living creatures. You know, they suggest that you should, um, you should not practice violence against anyone. You know, these are universalistic ideas. In other words, they're, they're forms of um, moral injunction which apply to everyone, regardless of whether that person is also a Buddhist or, or also of your ethnic group or something like that. Um, and of course, you'll find the same thing in the texts of any major religion, right? We have uh, highly universalistic uh, moral injunctions in Christian texts, and in Muslim texts, and, and others. Um, but of course, we also know uh, that in practice throughout history, um, members of all of these religions have behaved in ways which are uh, often um, actually more about defending their own religion and attacking other people's religions, right? But, so this also happens. Um, uh, and so what we did in, in these studies was we, we used a combination of psychometric uh, surveys and um, and an experimental, uh, a priming experiment, which um, uh, which also employed some of these, these survey devices to measure um, the relationship between um, people's affiliation to uh, great and little tradition Buddhism in Burma and their um, and their moral orientations, their sort of moral psychological uh, tendencies. And what we found was that people who are very affiliated to the great tradition of Buddhism are not actually universalistic. They don't actually seem to have more concern for um, humanity as a whole. What they do have is a much greater degree of um, in-group based morality. So they seem to be much more interested in the kinds of moral concerns that have to do with defending the in-group um, implicitly in competition with out-groups. And that in-group, um, in the Burmese case, um, is very likely to be understood as not only a religious, uh, but also an ethnic in-group, because in, in the Burmese case, these things are mixed up. So part of my argument is, I think, and this is just a hypothesis, but I think that if we were to, if we were to try to replicate this in other places, that we would find something similar, in, not only in other Buddhist countries, but also in, in the case of other religions that, um, you know, the texts may be uh, very universalistic. And there certainly are people who, you know, religious believers who are universalistic. I'm not saying that no one is, but, um, but membership of these great traditions, I would suggest, um, is more likely to have the effect of promoting in-group based um, moral cognition, moral psychology, rather than, um, than actually promoting universalistic orientations. Little traditions, how do they promote cooperation and sociality and what is an attractive yes little traditions and what is an attractive position 
Uh, okay, so <laughs> these are these are two two uh, very um, different questions. But, um, so the first the first question: um, How do little traditions promote? Lots of different. So little traditions. I mean, firstly, I I should maybe say. Um, a little bit more about what they actually are. So, as I said, they they're, they're often portrayed as being kind of superstitions or the things that you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing, but they often include, uh, you know, a lot of very local religious practices and beliefs. So, for example, you know, while a great tradition um, will often promote gods, um, which are kind of universal gods or gods of the whole religious group or something like that. Um, uh, people also have spirits and gods which are local. So, you know, um, in some places there's a spirit which um, belongs to a particular field or a particular irrigation ditch which is shared between farmers or a spirit of a particular village or of an ancestral uh, lineage group. Um, and, um, and this is a clear sort of one clear difference between little and great traditions is that the, the, the concerns of little tradition of religiosity tend to be much more local. They tend to be much more particular, where, whereas for great tradition religiosity, they tend to be much, uh, much sort of more translocal and much more about a, a bigger abstract collectivity. And how do these how do these things promote cooperation in, in, in lots of ways? But, you know, um, for example, you know, there's, there's a long history in anthropology of um, documenting ways that, you know, when people um, worship at a shrine together, for example, it, 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 it binds them together in lots of ways. Um, they may uh, perform rituals that are uh, very emotionally arousing and that um, you can only do with small groups of people, but they create very powerful bonds between those people. Um, <clears throat> then it may not be a question of the intensity of the ritual, it may be a question of um, uh, just having a shared, you know, for example, the fact that we have a shared uh, deity who is the deity of our, of our village means that we are all uh, cooperating to make offerings to that deity and then all of the activities we, we do to do that uh, bind us together and then enable us to, to cooperate in other ways too, like building irrigation ditches or, or, um, or building houses. Um, um, but there's a, there's a whole range of possible ways that this could happen. Um, uh, the, the key point I think is that, is that you know, while great tradition religiosity, you know, tends to bind people together in, in such a way that they're more likely to be able to cooperate with strangers, right? Because it, it, it creates the sense that you're a member of this abstract group and that people who are members of this abstract group uh, are likely to follow certain rules so you can depend on them in certain ways, right? That means if I'm a traveling Buddhist or a traveling Muslim who's traveling along a trade route, you know, let's say along the Silk Roads a couple thousand years ago, you know, um, many merchants converted to Buddhism. And one of the one of the reasons why that was useful is because if they met another merchant who was a Buddhist, they could they could trust that there was going to be a certain kind of uh, cooperation that would take place. On the other hand, little traditions are all about cooperation between people who actually know each other uh, or you know this is one of the key things that they do so so you know this is a smaller scale form of uh, of, of cooperation um, but it's it, 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 it requires rituals and beliefs that actually sustain um, these these more local relationship networks um, on the, the other question you asked was about attractive positions yes what's what's an attra what's an attractor position? So um, this is just a, an idea from evolutionary uh, theory. So, you know, if you have um, the kind of, uh, if you have the kind of space of um, all possible um, forms of, uh, say, a ritual um, uh, that can, that, that can uh, all forms of a ritual can take, I don't know, um, a particular initiation ritual or something like that. Um, and as people practice that ritual, um, it, it sort of changes randomly because people are constantly improvising or making mistakes or, or whatever. Um, 
So you can imagine the different ways that ritual might might uh, might change as a kind of random walk through uh, through a state space, through a space of all the different um, uh, possibilities that it can take. Um, but um, the idea of an attractive position is that um, there are certain uh, areas in that space um, which are um, which are sort of more favorable for whatever reason. So it might be because uh, the ritual is more appealing emotionally or cognitively it takes advantage of certain things about our psychology it might be because um, people who uh, engage in that ritual are um, uh, more likely to be imitated by other people um, and these um, um, and, and the closer you kind of get to these positions in the state space the more likely you are to then um, to stay within those uh, those those areas Kind of like uh, they sort of have like a gravitational pull, um, and uh, and so we would expect that if you if you took a random ritual, it would it would gradually move toward one of these attractive positions. Okay, so essentially, the concept of an attractor position is basically describing how people become immersed in religion. So, you in your article you describe it as the epidemiology of representations, according to which religious representations are analogous to diseases exhibiting different types and magnitudes of virulence. virulence. Yeah, that's, a, that's an idea from Dan Sperbo, the, the idea, the, the, this phrase, the epidemiology of uh, representations. So it's a it's uh, one of several different ways of um, talking about um, this concept that I mentioned earlier of cultural evolution. But yeah, it's the, it's the idea of uh, trying to understand how cultural practices spread through a population in much the same way as an epidemiologist understands uh, the way a disease spreads through a population. All right, then. So we're still on the issue of great traditions versus little traditions. In your piece, we're also greeted with the notion of relational mobility. What is relational mobility and how does this concept re relate to great and little traditions? Uh, well, relational mobility is just a, uh, a construct that um, was developed a few years ago that um, basically just, um, uh, it's, it's the idea that um, uh, in some societies, it's it's easier for people to kind of move uh, between relationships than, than others. So in some societies, people are more uh, stuck in a in a kind of fixed network of relationships. You know, you, you're born um, with a certain family and friends and neighbors, and, and you're going to stay with them for the rest of your life. And in some societies, you can choose you can you can choose to just kind of move and 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 uh, meet new people and um, and so on. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, so one of the ways that we wanted to, to sort of test our ideas about um, great and little traditions in the Burmese context was to look and see how these two uh, related to relational mobility, because, you know, <clears throat> even within the same society, of course, you have people who are more, who are more relationally mobile and, and less relationally mobile. Um, <clears throat> and what we, um, what we sort of predicted was that um, if you're a, a member of the great tradition, you would um, be more likely to be relationally mobile um, and a member of the little tradition, you'd be less likely. And that's what we found. The reason uh, <clears throat> behind that prediction is, um, is quite simply that um, the, again, great tradition morality um, is, or, or moral orientation is all about, um, in, at least in the Burmese case, um, is all about um, the idea of cooperation with and allegiance to this abstract collectiv collectivity. When you when you have that kind of morality and that kind of way of thinking about things, it's it's going to be easier for you to kind of um, um, go to a different city, to a different place, and establish relationships on the basis of that shared. Uh, allegiance and also <clears throat> um, the, the reverse is also true so the more you move around the, the more likely you are to um, to sort of plug into these, this transnational uh, orientation on the other hand the the little tradition um, if it's doing what we say which is sustaining um, 
cooperation at a local level, we would expect it to be more heavily uh, relied on by people who are less relationally mobile, because the more stuck you are with your kin and your, and your neighbors, the more you're going to need to lean on the little tradition in order to sustain that. It's, it's, it's a particularly interesting point, I think, because um, in Burma, uh, you know, actually, members of the little tradition do travel, uh, I mean, sorry, everybody's a member of both, right? But people who are very into the little, little tradition do travel. So they have these, 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 um, these spirit possession festivals that happen every year all around Burma, <clears throat> but particularly in the center of the country. And people travel all, all over the country to go to these festivals. Um, there are some people who do a circuit, who travel around to different um, spirit possession rituals, who, uh, who take part in these things all over the place. So <clears throat> it's not that it's not that people who participate in the little tradition are not traveling, actually. They do travel, uh, they do take part in translocal um, sort of institutions. But nevertheless, um, the little tradition affiliation does predict lower relation and mobility. So um, I would suggest that this is not because these are people who don't travel or people who are very parochial. It, I, it's, it's, it's more likely to be because um, the little tradition is actually just in, it's more important for them because they're people who have a more more reliance on, on a on a fixed set of relationships. So little traditions are serving a different purpose. That's our argument, yes. Yes. And in in your conclusion, it is also stated that although great traditions are not necessarily universalistic, little traditions suppress little traditions suppress universalism expound please well so again i cannot i, ca I can't <laughs> i can't yet say whether this is true outside of the one case of Burmese buddhism um, what we did find in this case is that um is that the more someone is affiliated to the little tradition uh the 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 less likely they are to um to sort of um uh, well, the, 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 the more weakly they, they sort of express universalistic morality. And um, uh, it seems to be what's happening in this case, um, I would argue, is that um, the, the great tradition is kind of fostering a sense of in-group allegiance. Uh, the little tradition is fostering a sense of allegiance towards your local relationships, kin, friends, neighbors. But also what the little tradition is doing is it is um it seems to be also sort of um uh making it more likely that you'll think of things in terms of um your particular relationships with particular people and therefore um less likely to think that you should help out random strangers right less likely that you should be universalistic because if you're going to favor look you know your, your family and your friends that means you have to um you have to you, you can't give equal preference to um to to strangers so you can't be a universalist if you're going to be a, a, a particularist so um so it, you know it kind, of, it kind of makes sense and it, we may well find it in, in other cases um but uh yeah it, it's as i say this is all um, a hypothesis at the moment about apart from about the, the one case you're your research is indicative of the studies done by Joseph Henrich and co-authors. Quite similar in the sense that Westerners are less likely to, in, to invest in kinship norms. Kinship and kinship intensity is not positively correlated with universalism. So in this sense, I'm seeing many parallels. Yeah, I mean, I'm not convinced that uh, Westerners are um, all that universalistic, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I um, yeah, I think that the, um, you know, one thing I've argued in the past and uh, um, in, in my, my previous work in, in China um, is that I, I, I think um, it definitely, you know, and, and a lot of other people argue this too, so it's not just me, but um, I think the, the, it's pretty clear that dependence on local relationships is going to decrease um, the more you have economic development, the more you have urbanization, the more you have um, kind of monetization of the economy, 
Uh, it's something that we've definitely seen in China over the last yes. uh, sort of decades, the, the weakening of these relationship networks, the weakening of the importance of kin and, uh, and, and other, other kinds of relationship networks. But that doesn't mean, uh, and, and this is something I argue in my PhD thesis, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that um, just because those relationships are weakened doesn't mean it gets replaced automatically by universalism. In fact, um, it can just be replaced by kind of a moral vacuum as well. Um, if you're able to buy everything you need on the open market and uh, you don't really need to cooperate that much with people, um, then um, you can, uh, there are a lot of alternatives. It doesn't necessarily have to be universalism that replaces the, 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 the kinship networks. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'd be a little bit wary of characterizing Westerners as being as being all that universalistic, but but certainly in general, we we have particularly Northern European cultures um, have a lot less uh, sort of dependence on on you know kin networks and things like that. All right, so Mark, what are you working on now? Researchers are always producing new data. Uh, well. Um, Right now, uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually working on starting a project um, to try to um, extend this, uh, the findings of this paper to replicate them in some other countries. So, um, so I'm going to be in uh, toward the end of well, the second half of this year, um, hopefully, um, starting to look at potentially running studies in a few other countries in, in Southeast Asia, not only Buddhist countries, but also Muslim countries. Uh, Muslim countries and um, and places with Christian populations to try to see if we can replicate what we did in Burma. Um, and, and one thing I think that's interesting as well that I, I'm, I'm gonna be trying to do is um, um, actually bringing together this project with what I did previously in China, which wasn't anything to do with religion, um, to try to test the idea that, um, uh, well, exactly what we've just been talking about, that, um, uh, the way that um, not only little and great traditions, but um, kind of cooperation um, at these different scales, um, how it's affected by by things like economic and demographic change. Um, particularly interested in how COVID um, outbreaks across Asia might have affected um, people's sense of um, of um, inter intergroup competition and uh, and how that might have affected religious affiliation. So. Yes, I really appreciate the literature on COVID-19. At this point, I am more interested in the impact of COVID-19 on innovation, trust, and the rule of law. And I mm. like what I've been reading. There's actually a new paper on COVID-19 innovation and individualism. I read it produced by a not I believe that at the moment, the writer resides in the West, but I don't think that she was born in a Western country. Maybe she's from somewhere in Asia. I can't remember her name. She was the lead author, but it's a fascinating paper. Hmm. I'll have to have a look. Yeah, I can yeah. send you the link. But Thanks. Mark, I really en I'm really enjoying our conversation, but unfortunately, I have to wrap up, and I hope that in the future, I will be reading a book titled why do great and little traditions exist in modern societies? Are you going Thank to write you very a book? Much. Will you write a book? Uh, possibly. All right. <laughs> Bye, Mark. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much.